We got there eventually. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Ryan. Um, I am working at Finastra as a developer relations lead. Previously, my experience has been as an API product manager at a CMA 9 bank. Um, I won't say which one, but you could probably guess. There's not very many. Um, and I want to talk today around, is DX the new CX? So to start off, I want to talk about actually what do we mean by customer experience? And there's a really popular diagram that I saw once, so I've kind of ripped that off, where it looks at UX and UI. So saying how it's, it's not this, it's not ever this. It's kind of like this with the intersection between UX and UI. And then it goes on to say that ideally it's this, and perfectly it's this diagram. So I have copied that from a well-known, oh, Yes, it's back. Then it's gone. Oh. Eh, I won't touch it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of well known enough. I argue that the new perfect actually looks like this. Because if you think about developer experience, it touches everything across your UI, your UX, your CX as well. So that's my, this is what my talk's going to be bit of an argument of why this is the new version, the new perfect. So key themes I'm going to talk about is first a bit around your developer journey. If you're building a developer portal, some of the thinking that I do behind that. And then also if you think about the impact of your business um, model on actual that developer experience, I'm going to carry on going regardless of slides, so it doesn't matter. Also then how do you start shifting your organization to the right mindset to do APIs right. I've been an API product manager in a, a company which is typically B2B or B2C. I class business to developer a little bit differently. So yeah, so starting off with the developer experience, I kind of oversimplify it to these five areas in terms of getting it right. So initially thinking about how does someone find your API to begin with. So I'm looking for a payments API, a lending API, transactions. How can I land on your landing page and find out, it, do I even want to look at you? Um, and then how do you then take that to getting started? So the whole idea of, can I, can I explore your API a little bit and do kind of, it's kind of like a hello world, but do my first API call. And then once you have a bit more confidence that you want to use it, you then go through the onboarding flow into to guidance and integration, then into monitoring once you're using it. So if I break down very simply some of these areas, with explor exploration, I look at sort of, you've got one minute to capture their interest, uh, if that. Um, so if they land on your page, they're gonna wanna know what are your APIs actually offering. And this is why I'm a big fan of public APIs over private APIs. So I've been in places before where you'll see the public APIs, which will be the open banking ones, um, but there's a load more interesting private APIs, which you don't know about unless you're a particular company, which they tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, Uber, we want to talk to you, um, which I think is interesting. Um, I don't believe in private APIs. I think public APIs are better. Equally, thinking about your stakeholders, so I broadly split into two. You've got your developer, the person who's actually going to be technically working with your API, but equally you've got someone on the business side who could be a product manager who wants to explore and understand, do I want to use your API? Does it do what I think it needs to do? Should I get my, my tech resource now engaged with this? So some, I've, I spend my Christmases, it sounds quite sad actually, looking at the market and doing a bit of a review, I actually might borrow your adapter to stop the flickering. It could be that. Um, and I'm going to multitask. Oh yeah, great. So, yeah, I spend my Christmas basically reviewing, <laughs> reviewing like 80 different developer portals to find out what the best practice is. And I'm about to do that again come, <laughs> come December. Hopefully this will come back on. So yeah, and there's some really good examples of people like, I'd actually praise Deutsche Bank. They do it quite well when it comes to developer and business stakeholders in terms of what their APIs do. So another thing that I always like to say is 
ideas need air to breathe, which should pop up there. Um, because so many people don't talk about what they want to do with APIs because they're worried someone's going to steal it. I love the portals who actually say, here's an idea of an API. Let us know if you're interested before we go and build it. Then if you look at getting started, so they know that they want to use your API or they think they want to use the, your API and they think it's, it will do what it needs to be, uh, what it needs to do. So you've got about 10 minutes for them to actually try implementing it, and when I say implementing it, it's your first API call, so they can understand a bit more about the richness of your API. And if I was to think about some companies who do this quite well, you've got Zero. if people are familiar with the accounting platform, they have an API previewer, which is a really nice way of you don't have to, to do much to get an idea of what are you gonna get out as your response from this API. And equally, you've got Stripe, which is a very well-known developer brand, they've got pre-builds, so it just speeds up that journey of how can I use your API, how do I make it as simple as possible. Now, it's also handy to offer a, a checklist, and I've learned this uh, rather recently, in that we have this fantastic video which kind of explains the journey, but it's only in a video format. There is no checklist, there is no, nothing you can review back and go, tick, I've done this, I'm following that path. And who really wants to keep on going back on a video? Um, we got that out of doing a developer experience audit. I'd done it at my previous company. I moved to Finastra, and we just completed one. And we are kind of taking that audit now and saying, OK, this is how we're going to implement it. Complete disclosure, our portal is not perfect. I don't, think, I don't believe in perfection. I believe in excellence. But we're on a journey, and we're, we're slowly getting there by talking about some of these techniques. So third step on onboarding. So now they actually want to implement your, your API. And if you think of a typical funnel, you want to maximize conversion from someone who's come to your landing page, thinks they want to work with you. They're pretty sure the API does what it needs to do. Now there's that important step of them actually getting it into UAT and production. But this is also where the horrible thing of due diligence and onboarding and compliance and legal comes in. Um, my view, especially for financial services, is to stagger the approach of your barriers to entry when it comes to onboarding. So when they're still kind of implementing your API and it's, you know, they're testing it out and it's kind of going to UAT, it's not in live production yet. Um, so do you need to do that final level of um, compliance checks? So you may want to be doing sanctions checks if you're in financial services um, early on. You could do that quite simply, but do you really need to know everything like the mother's maiden name? I'm joking about mother's maiden name, but I have sat in the process where it's like, why are you asking all these questions now? They may turn around and say, actually, your API is not going to work for us. Why waste the time for both of you when actually you wait until they're ready and they say, we're now going into live into production, what's the final step? People who do that quite well, um, I shouldn't. Ma I, know, I know some people. I was talking to a fintech rather recently, and they were saying actually we have a three-month process to get onto one of the banks, and they actually prefer a three-month process where they have weekly check-ins um, to go through all the criteria they need to get onto the the partner program, which I thought was quite interesting because we were trying to do a, a one-hit wonder of provide everything in one go and then that's it. They actually preferred the longer kind of bit by bit, let's drip feed it in. So if we start to look at guidance, so this is around actually how do you support your developers in, in terms of getting it into production and how do you provide kind of two sources of help. So you've got self-help, which is ones that people love because it's non-resource intensive for your company. But how do you have good guides, tutorials, demos? Also, how are you, do you have a presence on Stack Overflow? Are you contributing towards GitHub repos? What are you doing to make it as easy as possible? And then when it comes to offering more help, um, when they get stuck or if something's missing, how can you be across different channels from email, Twitter, community pages, if you've got your, your own page like we do at Finastra, phone as well is some examples, there, um, that is an option, and then Slack as well. A company which I saw who did this quite well was one called Nexmo, if you're familiar with them, and they actually, they're very transparent in saying, here's your support structure, 
here's your SLAs. Also, here's our different models. Here's the free version, and this is what you get. You only get email, I'm just making it up, I don't know what theirs actually is, but you only get email and Twitter support. But if you pay per month, you'll also get phone, um, and they also have different kind of SLAs and how quickly they'll get back. Very transparent and really cool when it comes to support. And then I'll move on to the fifth one in terms of monitoring. So once they've actually got it live out and running, you obviously want to track usage and if there's any issues. And two things that come to mind here is how can you invite other people, other developers in your team to see that, that portal, see how many APIs calls your app's making. Briefly, how do you let people know about your API status page? So something's gone wrong, a customer is having an issue with, say, their app. They want to know, is it my app or is it the API provider? And there was an interesting, bless you, um, I don't want to shame any banks, but there was a challenger bank um, in the UK who, on their Slack channel, what they do is they have a, a status page and they only report ones on there if it's been out for longer than 15 minutes. So if it was, say, 10 minutes it was out, they wouldn't keep it on the status page. And they got a lot of backlash from people saying, five, 10 minutes still makes a difference because if I had a transaction going through during that time, I need to know whether it's me or you who's messed up. So I'm of the mindset of have a status page and track everything. Even if it's down for a short amount of time, that could mean something to someone. Uh, Finastra is implementing a status page for their APIs. It's coming. <laughs> And then moving on to the impact of your business model, depending on different APIs. So this is really putting my hat on from when I was an API product manager. And I start to look at different routes to market and different revenue models. So if you start to look at indirect revenue models, um, in my experience, banks were very scared when you say banking as a service. So we went with product distribution. You've got existing products. How do you expand it to kind of off-state premises? To bring it to life, I'm going to talk through a couple examples. So first of all, show of hands, who here has ever got a mortgage? Okay. Who here went directly to a bank for the mortgage? Oh, you guys are true. Who went to a broker? Okay. About roughly at the bank I was at, around 70% of our mortgage business came through brokers. So when we were thinking about how do we increase the number of mortgages that we're selling, through APIs, actually who we're going to target are brokers. And there's examples where we had a really simple pre-population API, that's it, because brokers were spending on average about 10 hours a week filling out the same information again and again just to interact with us. So what we did we were, when I was there was in the process of implementing a pre-population API to take down 10 hours to one hour of admin that's a big difference. You're making it easier for a mortgage broker to interact with you with the, the idea that you will get more business, more mortgage business, because you're easier to work with. That impacts your developer experience, because your developer, in that case, is a mortgage broker. Um, equally, when it comes to lending, we were looking at how do you, sorry, um, how do you actually take lending off of your estate. So most banks will do it on their own mobile banking or online banking or digital branches. How do we increase loans? But quite a lot of people go to aggregators now, like moneysupermarket.com. So thinking about how you leverage the data that you have in lending to go to moneysupermarket.com. And the way that that model works is if a loan comes through moneysupermarket.com, usually a bank pays them a bounty. So when it comes to tracking API calls, they want to know how many have converted into actual loan sales because they're going to charge you. So thinking about that is some of the things which I think about when I think about developer experience, depending on the API. So who is the target audience? What's the motivation? So moneysupermarket.com wants to send more business to you because they get more money, they get more bounty fees from you. Um, and what impact does it have? Um, if you look at direct models in terms of APIs. So there's a really good example of gov.uk verify. So some people don't know what it's like, but if you've um, ever had to renew your driving license or passport in the UK, uh, there's n about 19 government services where you can authenticate yourself digitally through one of five providers, 
them providers being Barclays, Experian, and Post Office, and two others. And what's interesting there is when they were implementing that system, they actually had to really think about customer experience. So you've got general public here renewing the driving license. You've got five API providers there of identity. From a consumer point of view, they're going to need consistent journeys across no matter which provider they go through. So what was really interesting was that in this case, the client, as in the government, had to say, okay, you need to build me an API which has this flow because our ultimate end customer needs to have consistency. So that's quite interesting when you think about how you're actually building APIs and who your client is and why CX is still important. And with consumption-based models, they want to see how many have actually, how many API calls have you made, how many have been successful, because we as the API provider want to charge them. So that's quite interesting when you think about different models. And then you've got Marketplace, um, which for me, that's what Financial does. We have a financial app marketplace. And there's a few things, a past, you know, beyond integration, there's a load more things that you've still got to do. Once you have an app that's integrated on a marketplace, you've then got to sell it. And that's where it's interesting when it comes down to who do you need to have involved. So yes, you've had a developer involved in building the app, but once it's on a marketplace, it then starts to become about how do you market that app? Your developer's not a marketeer, so actually how do you start engaging the marketing team at that company to be involved in how you sell it? Um, my visual for it is a double funnel, so the whole awareness of your portal, getting them to build onto it, and as soon as it's on the marketplace, it then inverts, and it's all about how do you then get it with one client and then expand it out to multiple? And how do you offer different support mechanisms when it is about a marketplace and it's beyond just APIs? So last section is on shifting organizational mindsets, which I love because if you're a B2B company or a B2C company, <laughs> B2D, which I refer to as very much B2B2C, to C, I've just said a load of words there, um, <laughs> it's quite interesting. So what I did when I, when I was an API product manager is first of all looking at cross-functional education. So to get anything moving in any company, you need a suite of teams behind you. So what I would do is, I remember going in just kind of assuming that they knew what APIs meant. Turns out they didn't. So I would start with the basics of what APIs are and how they work. And then also looking at leading developer portals. And my example that I would use is be like, okay, how many people have heard of Twilio? If I asked it here, you'd probably have a few hands go up. But I was in a room where I asked and they went, like no hands went up. Then I said, well, have you ever used Uber or MNS or uh, Twitter, et cetera, I started naming all these companies. I'm like, yeah, they use Twilio, so you've actually probably used their API, you've just been unaware of it. By the way, like 2019, they were valued at 19 billion. They have three, about 3,000 employees, and they are 11 years old. They're valued more than our entire retail bank here. And our retail bank's been going for hundreds of years and has thousands and thousands of customers. That, I, I saw it in the room, they shifted, and they went, oh my God, this is an opportunity for us. How do we not know about it? And it's all about taking it back to the basics and assuming they don't know anything. And that was engaging with different teams like branding, marketing, who you know you wouldn't expect necessarily to know about this. Equally, legal and compliance is very different. Which leads me on to my next point around having an open dialogue with a control tribe. So if you want to get a, an API business going, then actually having fast decision making can be quite key. So we created control tribes where we'd engage with risk, legal, marketing, uh, fin crime, and compliance. Get them into a room, we'd have weekly conversations about this is what's happening. And aside of that, I actually had m informal monthly catch-ups with legal and compliance specifically, because they were the two people you wanted on side. And I would just say, hey, let's just go for a coffee. This is what's going on in our business unit. I just want to give you a heads up. Um, which was really nice, actually, and they appreciated it to the point where they said, Do you know what, Ryan, I don't know what our legal or compliance uh, requirements need to be for an API. And they were really honest with me, and I was like, can you, can you help with that decision making? So what was really great there is as an API product manager, I was able to influence the decision making of saying, you say this is a big issue, it's not. 
Can we park that? This is a more important one. Let's not make it overcomplicated because we were trying to shove API products into a governance framework which were for digital banking and it just broke it. So we actually started recreating the process. Um, my last point on shifting organizational mindsets is all about the top-down buy-in. So I've been very fortunate at Finastra that the number one initiative for the whole company is platform. So Finastra provides financial technology for banks in payments, lending, retail, corporate banking, treasury and capital markets. We're a technology provider. And what we've decided to do is turn it into a platform and open up these core banking systems to fintechs, developers, banks, et cetera, to, to innovate because we know innovation's got to be coming from the wider ecosystem, not just us. And what's great is everyone at the company is aware. When I go and say, hey, I work on building our developer community for our platform, they know what the platform is and they understand it. Where I've been in other companies where you say platform and they'll be like, oh, this is a platform, that's a platform. We have many platforms. I'm like, not the one I'm thinking of. It's not a developer portal. Um, so if you don't believe me, I, I, shameless plug. Ours is developer.fusionfabric.cloud. Um, as I said, we are improving it constantly and we like to take feedback. So have a play around, explore it. Um, and another shameless plug <laughs> for me is uh, we're actually running a hackathon as well called Hack to the Future, which I love back to the future. So, um, but yeah, if you're interested in playing around with APIs, then have a look at the hackathon as well. So going back to the original question is, is DX the new CX? And I think DX has always been there, but now kind of with open banking, it's been a catalyst for companies to shift their mindset into what a developer business means. So I think more people are more conscious of it, and I think it's just gonna grow. Um, very last thing is, I think the future of CEOs may look like this. Hopefully you're familiar with the Steve Ballmer, developers, developers, developers. Um, but I really wanna get the Finastra CEO doing this at our next conference. Maybe not as sweaty. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, happy to take any questions and talk offline. Thank you. Um, just one quick question. Do developers actually use the phone to ask for support? Does that happen? Have you guys ever? <laughs> yes? You see, you learn everything at API Days. Wow. I think that's great, but you know, I'm not a developer. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so I always kind of do every six months a little bit of a review what's going on in the market and I shift the focus. So like sometimes I've looked at what support do they provide. I did one where it was looking at what products are they offering through APIs. Um, this year it's undefined what I'm going to be looking at um, because I've, I've moved companies in that time. So actually I'll probably be looking at marketplaces and looking at um, really good examples of companies who've done marketplace really well. And for me, there's people like Zero, but there's equally people like Shopify who play not in the financial space, um, but we could probably learn some from that. So yeah, marketplaces will probably be where I'll be looking. Um, I also like to say, uh, Finastra, another shameless plug, are very open with stuff, which is nice, and that you can see all of the APIs and the documentation without signing up. Um, I'm also, I know there are some competitors, and this is what makes market research really hard, who really keep it very closed off. So it's, it's with a pinch of salt that my market research that I can do just on my desk will not be fully accurate because I won't have access. So I once did, I was working on wealth management APIs and a lot of API platforms for wealth management, you have to be invited specifically. You have to send them an email to say, hey, will you let me register? <laughs> so. Um, I've gone off on a tangent, but probably marketplaces. Cool. Any other questions? Do you think that uh, the digital core role that you're taking on from the digital core role will be anything like <coughs> the digital core role that you're taking on from the digital core role? Yes. No, so, uh, 
So going back to my old role, I was there as an API product manager, but kind of side of desk, I was doing developer relations plus some developer experience. And I was like, actually, it's really hard to do multiple things to try and come up with a product and then get it out to market while then looking at where you're hosting it. So actually having more people behind it to kind of divvy up your time because I'm not going to give 24-7 to a role here. I'm a fan of uh, kind of having a portfolio career. I have other interests. So I think it's good to kind of say, do you know what, your focus is on getting our developer experience right or reaching out to our audiences and building that community vibe. More people, the better, as long as there's no politics. <laughs> so, cool. Um, I'm, I'll stick around anyway because I generally am a bit more honest when I'm off of camera, and I will tell you more horror stories with some names. <laughs> cool.